our message. Listen, I want to thank you for praying for the David Robinson family. Thank you pray, for praying for Amanda Monax and her family over these last number of not just weeks, but number of months. Um, be sure and share with her how much we love her this morning. Listen, we're listening to so many people at the visitation yesterday that uh, uh, many folks looking to stay for the funeral. Listen, there was just, it was packed. It's packed. And I had told Amanda, I said, listen, I said, the grace of God's poured out on you on a day like, on a day like that where God uses people to come by and say a few words of kindness and love on you a little bit. And so, uh, Kevin, just give her our love and uh, let's pray for them. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for um, David Robinson. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that he knew you and you knew him and he's home in heaven with you. Father, we pray for Amanda and Kevin and their family and Amanda's uh, family in Smith County and beyond, God, that you would bless them today and help them as they grieve the loss of their loved one. And Father, we thank you, Lord, how you show grace to us through so many people. You bless us during those times of grief. And Lord, that you pour out your love upon us. We're so thankful, Lord, that uh, you sympathize with us and you know uh, Lord, also today we ask you to help us hear your voice as we open up your word this morning. Lord, that if we have any distractions or anything that's caused us to think about other things, Lord, that during this time that we would listen to what your Holy Spirit says to us. So, Lord, may you teach us today uh, more than a preacher standing here, Lord. May your Holy Spirit be our teacher today. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn to Ruth chapter 2, or maybe you have a device, you can turn to Ruth chapter 2, point and click maybe, or turn to Ruth 2. Um, we're in a series that is looking at the life of David, and on the screen, um, it talks about David being a shepherd and a king, and I mentioned last week as we get, went into the series that God had me go toward the book of Ruth. And instead of going to Ancestry.com to look at David's, some of his lineage or genealogy, that we actually went to Ruth and, and we're talking about his great-grandmother. And um, last week, we, we got into a number of things in chapter 1. And what we saw there were perhaps links in a chain that brought Ruth to Boaz. And today we're going to talk about that even more um, Ruth comes into relationship with God as we, some of us are very familiar with the story, but there are links in that chain that brought her to him. Uh, looking back, we see that Ruth was a Moabite woman. We saw that last week in chapter 1, and so how she was outside of the promise of God, and how as a Moabite, they were under a curse from God for all kinds of sins that the Moabite people had committed against God's people and sending false prophets into the land. We talked about Balaam for a moment, but how uh, Balaam was going with a false prophecy and, and uh, God intervened and Balaam actually spoke a, a blessing upon God's people instead of a curse. But, uh, but God did bring down a curse upon the Moabite people and uh, we found Ruth was a Moabite and so she's outside of the promise of God and she stands in great need and she was going through a difficult situation. Um, but as we read last week, we found these links in a chain that, uh, a chain that changed all of that. And if you take a look at the screen, we'll go through a few of these links. And listen, if you weren't here last week, or maybe just as a refresher, we're going to cover for just a minute a couple of these links to bring us up to speed where we're going to begin in chapter 2. Link number one that we found last week was a famine. A famine in the land of Bethlehem, Judah, and it caused Elimelech, uh, listen, uh, upon bad, a bad idea, he decides to leave Bethlehem, Judah, and go into the land of Moab looking for some type of provision there. We know that was uh, uh, the wrong thing to do, but that's what he did. He left the place where God had placed his name, and he goes into a place that was cursed. And so we see a famine strikes the land, and that may be the very first link in a chain that we find that brought Ruth to Boaz. The second link in the chain was a family. Um, Elimelech and his wife, they move there to Moab. They have two sons, and they're there for a number of years. And these two sons, they marry two Moabite women. Uh, one was named Orpah, and the other was named Ruth. And, and so, listen, these Moabites were under a curse. So these two Israelite men 
living in Moab, find two women. They're unequally yoked to them because they're of God's people, and these Moabite women are not of God's people. Uh, Elimelech and Naomi come from a place where they knew the one true living God, but we have um, these two women that marry Naomi and Elimelech's sons. They, they don't know the one true living God. We saw that. And so these two sons, they grow older. They marry these Moabite women. Um, and we see that in chapter 1 as well. Link number 3, if we're doing links in a chain, we found a funeral in chapter 1. We find that Naomi's there living with her husband in, in Moab. She's went along for the ride, her and her two sons. But lo and behold, while they're in the land, years later, we found that Elimelech, he dies. He dies, and that's bad, but listen, it gets worse. We find that her two sons, Naomi's two sons, they both die as well. And so now we have Ruth and Orpah. They're also widows along with Naomi. So we find that, that God uses this, though. He uses a funeral as a link in a chain. Let me tell you, tell you something. Have you, have you ever noticed that God can use anything that he wants to make something happen? He can. In fact, if you take a look back at chapter 1, if we were to look back, we find that, especially when we got to the end of chapter 1, Naomi's take on everything was that, that God had allowed her husband to die and that God had allowed her two sons to die. And, and Naomi understood that God is the giver of life and she recognized his sovereignty and that he's in charge of these situations. And so, so she has the right perspective, but she recognizes that, you know what, I've, I've lost my husband, I've lost my two sons. And, uh, and so Ruth is one of these daughter-in-laws and now she's a widow as well. Links in a chain. And, chain. and by the way, it, maybe not this week, but maybe the next sermon we get into Ruth, we'll also find that if God was going to redeem Ruth by Boaz, she would have to be a widow for that to happen. Anyhow, that comes later. The next link in a chain, link number four, is a fear. So fear begins to raise up on the, rise up on the inside of Naomi. She begins to think, you know what? Um, I'm alone now. I don't have a husband. Naomi says to her and to Orpah, I'm going to move back to Bethlehem, Judah. Um, God has visited his people. This word has come from Bethlehem to us in Moab. We've heard this from a distance that, that God has visited his people and he's providing for them. And Naomi decides that she's going to go back to Bethlehem, Judah. Unlike her husband who is a backslider that did not repent, we have Naomi that says, you know what? I'm going to go back to the people of God. I hear God doing something there. I want to be around that. I want to be around them. So she heads back to Bethlehem, Judah. In the process of that, she tells Orpah and she tells Ruth, you girls just go back and stay with your mom. Go back to your mom's house. And they didn't want to. They wanted to stay with her. But then uh, Naomi was persistent and she said, but now listen, listen, if I, were, if I were to find a new husband and then have a child or have a couple of men, uh, b boys, it, it would take them a long time to grow up and be your husbands. I'm sure you're not going to wait around for a husband that long. That's me paraphrasing it. And, and, and so Orpha recognizes that. And maybe she wanted a husband. And uh, today, you, if you're married here, you're thinking, I'm not sure I needed a husband, but you did. Amen. So anyhow, Orpha says, I, I need a husband. So she goes back to the land of Moab. But Ruth clung to Naomi. We found that in chapter 1. We also stated this, or I stated this last week is that in Ruth giving this counsel for these two women to go back to Moab was essentially saying, you shouldn't go with me to where I'm going to go. I'm going to go where God's people are and where the presence of God is. You stay where you're at in this lost place. Now, I know she didn't say that exactly, but if both of them had followed her counsel, then it went back to Moab and perhaps been lost forever. Because we talked last week how Deuteronomy 23 talked about there was a curse on Moab that went for 10 generations, for 10 generations a Moabite or an Ammonite because they come from illegitimate relationships. And we traced that back to Lot last week in Genesis that, that here it is, they're going to be in this curse or uh, outside of the will of God for so long. So the chances are Orpah, she goes back to Moab or stays in Moab rather. She's going to remain lost. But Ruth says, no, out of a fear, right, raises up in her. She's like, I don't want to live away from Naomi. I don't want to be alone. I, I want to go. She says to Naomi, Ruth says, I, I want to go where you go. I want to stay wherever you stay. And I want your God, capital G, God, I want your God to be my God. And while all that's going on, God's watching. And he's listening. He's orchestrating things. 
and he's watching how all this unfolds. It's amazing. Um, so link number five, then we come to today's message. We have a field, a field. Um, and this is where we pick up on in Ruth's story here in chapter two. If you're there, say amen. Let's have a word of prayer before we get into this text. Father God, I ask you to help us um, take this overview of where we were last week and me just scanning over that. Lord, help us see what we need to see here in chapter two. Lord, speak to our hearts. And Lord, while we see your sovereignty and your providence, may we also recognize we have a free will and that we need to align ourselves with what you would have us do, that we need to seek after your will, that we don't need to just make decisions on our own. We are thankful, God, in how you intervene and how you guide us, even at times when it seems like we're clueless. And there are times, God, that you are trying to guide us and we won't follow you at all. We see that happen, too, in our lives and also in other places in Scripture. But, Lord, today, help us see what we need to see in Ruth chapter 2. Speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we have, number one, we find a field. There's a field here in chapter 2, beginning at verse number 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him, in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, Whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in the charge in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. So here we have, after returning to Bethlehem, Judah, we have uh, Naomi and Ruth there. Uh, they find themselves coming back empty-handed, absolutely empty-handed. Uh, Naomi said earlier in the end of chapter 1, I, I, I went out full. I had, a son, I had two sons and a husband when I left Bethlehem, Judah, a long time ago, and now I've come back and I don't have any of them. I, I, I left out of here with a lot in my hands. I've come back empty, and so now we have Naomi back in Bethlehem, Judah, and we have Ruth there with her, a Moabite woman, and everyone knows that Ruth is a foreigner in this land. Um, but what Naomi and Ruth recognize is they're absolutely poor. They recognize they need provision. And so we have Ruth here recognizing this. So she says she offers that she's going to go out and she's going to work and she's going to glean from the edges of the field uh, after the reapers have passed by. And, and gleaning was God's welfare plan back in the Bible, amen. That's exactly what God would do for God's people. Listen, God legislated when reapers are bringing in the sheaves or harvesting their crops out in the field that they would leave the corners of the field, that they would leave those for the poor in the community. Now, the poor could have it freely, but they did have to come and work to get it, amen. They did have to show some interest in going out to the field. And when I read that this week, I'm thinking, Washington, D.C. needs to read this, but that's another sermon for another time, amen. Anyhow, they go out and they glean and they come behind these reapers. You could also, after the reapers are through in the middle of the field, they could come by in the middle of the field and, and take some of what hit the ground after the reapers went past. Um, there were also laws concerning this as far as when the reapers were to go and strike the, uh, the, the barley, when they were to cut that down, that only so much in their hand they could take and some that hit the ground, they left on the ground again uh, for the poor people to come and glean. Um, in this way, God provided for the poor. And again, they had to show interest in what they needed. They had to go out and work. Everyone worked. Everyone worked. But not all had to pay for that. So they go and they get this free from the corners of the field and they glean. In fact, take a look at the screen at Leviticus 19. Um, the Leviticus 19, verses 9 and 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest, and you shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. 
He said, our God is good, amen? Is he not good? Tell me, does that not make sense? It's an amazing thing here. I, I know there's a lot of trusting in one another with that, and back then there was an honor system with that, and, and the reapers and the owner of the field needed to not be greedy and all these things. Everyone needed to do what the law of God said, and if they did, even the poor were cared for. Well, Ruth knows that she and Naomi are poor. So she tells Naomi, she says, hey, listen, I'm going to go out into the fields and glean. Um, the fields were not like fields today. Um, we have fences between our fields. Some of you farmers, you've got fences, fence rows between your fields, and you go through a gate, and there's others. that Back in biblical days, it was a larger field, and there would be perhaps just large stones or other markers separating these fields. So these fields, listen, if me and Kevin and Jamie all own fields, they could be just side by side by side, and, and we would know, and the reapers that worked in our fields would know the boundaries, but it was just fields is what we would see. And that's the way it was in biblical days. Um, so Ruth, she heads out to the fields. Now, we read in the scripture here that Elimelech has a relative named Boaz that owns some of these fields. And verse 3 says that Ruth so happened to enter into one of the fields that belonged to Boaz. She so happened to walk into Boaz's field. That's the providence of God. What do you think? That's God directing somebody's steps. That's God making sure that she gets where she needs to go. That's God knowing that Elimelech has kinfolk. He has a man named Boaz that's in his family and that she needs to be in that field. She's related to Elimelech, Ruth, is because she married into his family. Let me tell you something. She had never married one of those sons of Elimelech and Naomi. She would never be there. At least if, if they hadn't have died, they would never be back in God's place as far as Bethlehem, Judah. If Ruth's husband had never died even, she wouldn't be in a position where she could actually be redeemed as a Moabite and be part of the family of God. And we'll see that air out today and also in the next time when we're in Ruth. But here we see the providence of God. Let me tell you something. God can put you at the right place at the right time to talk to the right person to have the right outcome. When he wants to do something, he can do it. Agreed? We also know that we have a free will. And we know there's a delicate balance in that. And every one of us in this room would say that, that in our free will, that there's times where we know that we've been at a crossroads, and maybe even God has allowed us, we make these choices. And then there's times, listen, there's times where we've made choices, and we've made poor choices, we've made good choices. And at other times, listen, in my own personal life, I can tell you there's times where I don't know if I had much of a choice in the matter. It's like God just shoehorned me into a situation, walked me right into something. I do think you and I can... Listen, spend time praying, saying, Lord, order my steps. If you notice, we pray for Morgan and Hunter and Mila. We're praying for God to order this baby's steps. When you and I pray for God to order our steps, we're inviting him to come along and get into the process and really even override what you and I are trying to do. If, we're, if our motive's not right and our motives need to be right, if you and I are heading in the wrong direction, if you and I are prayerfully submitting to God, and listen, one of my prayers often is that, Lord, you know I don't know what I'm doing sometimes, and Lord, I'll make a mess of this thing. God, I pray that you would put me in the right position to do what you want me to do. Help me. Lord, your will needs to prevail over me and my bad judgment or any of that. And so we know that there's a delicate balance there of our free will and then the providence of God and how he works things out. Here it is. God's working out a desired outcome for Ruth. But then later on we'll find for David and even for the Lord Jesus Christ because this lineage we're talking about goes that far. Um, do you see why this field is another link in the chain that brought Ruth to Boaz? You see why that's a link in the chain? Listen, if you're here today and you've been saved by the grace of God, there were links in the chain that brought you to Christ. There's people, a church, maybe a pastor, a grandmother, a Sunday school teacher, a co-worker, your mama, somebody. Somebody God used links in a chain to bring you to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Put you perhaps in the right place at the right time to hear a word from somebody or hear a preacher preach or a teacher teach a lesson or be at vacation Bible school on that day. You didn't come the other days, but you came that day when, when the gospel was shared or whatever it was. But links 
in a chain that brought you to the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, in this message today, uh, listen, I love this story. A real story played out with Ruth and Naomi and Boaz and all these things. And this is great, but listen, it won't mean a thing unless you and I walk out of here knowing that this same God is personal. That this same God that, listen, worked in Ruth's life and worked on things and was providential, he wants to be involved in your life. So if we just go out of here getting the the Bible story and the understanding of this and not apply it to our lives, we have missed, or I have missed as a pastor, or we missed enlisting for the Holy Spirit. So he wants to do a work in your life and mine. Not, listen, not just in bringing us to salvation, but even beyond that. Bringing us to salvation or drawing us and, and you and I submitting to him and calling on him. And when we get saved, that's the beginning of this walk. And then, then it's a lifelong journey of submitting to him, listening for him saying, Lord, please order my steps. Back to our text. It stands to reason that if a poor person is gleaning from the corners of the field, that the owner of that field, as he goes out to check on the the production or the, uh, the work of the reapers, that he would take notice to who's in his fields, and he would see perhaps maybe who is gleaning the corners of his field. Or maybe they would even speak to someone like that or, Possibly not. They're an owner of the field. They're perhaps a person of wealth. Would they really speak to the poor person in the corner, or would they just walk on by? What would they do? Boaz comes into this field from Bethlehem, and he sees Ruth, and he asks one of his reapers, he says, whose young woman is this? Whose young woman is this? Meaning, really what he's saying is, who's she married to? Who does she belong to? He's wanting to know that. I mean, like, she's certainly somebody's wife. Maybe there's someone engaged to her. Maybe, who does she belong to? He asked that question, and the reapers say, well, listen, she's the young woman that came back with Naomi. Boaz and everyone there had some level of understanding that Naomi had come back from Moab and that she had brought some young lady with her. And so Boaz hears this and he knows that, you know what, this is this young lady that come back with Naomi. And the, the reaper tells him and confirms that. And, and no doubt Boaz had heard this news, but now he realized that's who this is. That's the young lady. <laughs> and listen, he's probably thinking, she's not married to anyone? Is this the young widow? Uh, we don't know the backstory of Boaz in terms of like, his wife or first wife or if someone died like his, we don't know any of that, but, but, but he must be interested in the fact that as he sees her and recognizes she's this young widow, he's interested. Links in a chain. We have what? We had a famine. We have a funeral. We had a, a famine, a family, a funeral. We have a fear, and then now we have this field. It's all important that she is in Boaz's field. God's involved in her life. Sermon's back to you and me. Is God involved in your life and do you know it? I assure you, he's involved in and around your life, but sometimes we don't know it. What's he doing in your life? What's he saying to you? What's he speaking to your heart about? Who's he brought into your life? What turn of events have taken place that has he put you in a position to do this or that? Is is his hand on your life? And if you're not thinking along those lines, listen... I've been your pastor nearly four years. This type of providential preaching is all through my preaching. Y'all probably know that. Jason's got one sermon. He just finds a lot of ways to preach it. That's true. God is providential, and he's certainly sovereign. But he wants you as a submissive person to acknowledge him, submit to him, and be okay with what he wants to do, yield to him, be thinking about what he wants, Follow after him, be in his word to understand when the enemy brings a counterfeit and when a lie happens. He wants you to know his word. He wants you to follow after him. He is intimately interested in your life more than you could ever know. Enough that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. I look back at this text, even back in chapter 1, when Ruth says to Naomi, she says back there, she says, um, um, I'll go where you go, I'll lodge wherever you lodge, your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. When she said that to Naomi, Naomi must have been, it must have blessed Naomi's heart and soul, thinking, at least I'm going to have this daughter-in-law go back with me. This is so good. But I'll tell you what, God was listening. He was listening to Ruth. 
He was listening to what she said. And listen, she meant what she said. Another question, do you and I mean what we say to God? When we just say things to God, I'm telling you, he's listening. We need to mean what we say. Ruth says this to Naomi, but listen, God hears it, and he knows. Ruth, gleaning out in these fields, meeting Boaz. Um, she had work ethic. Um, the, the reapers, they tell Boaz, they're like, listen, uh, uh, she only went back to the house for a little bit, and he's not talking about back into town where Naomi's at. In between these fields, there's some type of tent or some type of covering that would shield them perhaps from the sun or the heat of the day. And, and they would go and take breaks in those places and, and they would have drink some water and things like that. These workers, these reapers are like, yeah, she's barely rested any at all. She's worked. She's worked. So the fifth link in this chain is this field. Uh, number two, we also see the favor as Boaz approaches Ruth. He's heard this word from the reapers. Now he's going to approach Ruth. We see his favor in beginning in verse number 8. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn, so she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you've left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. You might want to highlight that verse. It's amazing. Verse 13. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat behind the reaper, beside the reapers, and he passed parched grain to her, and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. Verse 16, Also, let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Now here it is, we have Boaz pouring out his grace upon Ruth. I mean, he's absolutely gracious. He tells her uh, to only glean in his fields. Like He said also, too, listen, I've told you these guys aren't going to touch you. She probably wasn't going to get that kind of protection from some other field owner in some other field. And he lets her know, and listen, that's grace. When God gives you security, it's grace. But Boaz says, hey, listen, just glean only in my fields here. Stay near my women that are gleaning. Stay here is what he says. Um, he, he tells her to drink water from the vessels that the men have drawn, like she didn't have to go get that water herself. Normally she'd go get that herself. But he's like, no, no, just go over there to where they have this water and you drink from their water. It's not something the other women did. It's not, they, listen, it's definitely not something that the poor people did from the corner of the field. We need to get this. We, we need to understand that we're not talking about just another townsperson out in his field. We're talking about somebody poor in the corner of the field and the owner of the field pouring out grace upon her um ruth is then she's humbled by the favor of boaz and she asks, why are you favoring me so much you know i'm a foreigner listen she knew that she's a moabite she's in the land of bethlehem judah she probably looks different talks different listen she didn't grow up singing the songs that they sing she didn't grow up knowing the one true living God like they did. She grew up in Moab in a place that was accursed. And she has found herself in Bethlehem, Judah. She looks different, probably talks different. And everyone knows she's a Moabite young lady and she's a widow, probably pitied by some people, looked down on by others, I'm sure. And here it is. She's in the corner of this field. And we have Boaz, who's a wealthy property owner, and he's showing all this grace to her. And she's like, why are you showing me all this grace? Why are you showing me all this favor as a, as a foreigner? It's what she says. Boaz lets her know that he knows all about her story. He knows about her work ethic. He knows everything. 
Um, Boaz said, let the Lord, he said, the Lord would repay your work, let the Lord would bless you in this land of refuge. Listen, land of refuge, he's letting her know right there that you've come to a place that's a safe place. Land of refuge. Now, it's another sermon for another time. There were cities of refuge we find in the, in the Old Testament. We see those, and some of those are on one side of the Jordan River. Some of those are on the other side of the Jordan River. And a banished one or someone that's in a place where they're being convicted of something, and maybe they're guilty or, excuse me, maybe they're innocent of it, uh, and, or they need to have their case heard. They could flee from someone showing uh, retaliation upon them, and they could get to this city of refuge, and they would be safe there. It was a protocol for someone to get into safety. And, and here it is, we have Boaz saying that, listen, you're in a place of refuge. Church, we as the church need to be a place of refuge for people that are outside the will of God. We need to be a place of refuge, and not only a place of refuge, but a people of refuge. The people that you and I work with, the family members that you and I know, the people that are in our lives or around our lives that are far from God, we need to be a refuge for them in that. You and I can help them find safety in that. We can, we can tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. We can be gracious to them and them have a good word from us. We could give them some type of security by sharing the gospel with, with people like that. Boaz goes on and he offers her a seat at his table. Uh, and he and the reapers, they gather at mealtime during the middle of the day. And um, she's not a castaway. She's not sitting at the, listen, she's not at the family event eating at the card table, amen. <laughs> Small table, you young people, listen, y'all thinking, when do I get to sit at the big table? I, listen, she's sitting at the big table. Doesn't matter that she's poor. We have Boaz pouring out his grace upon her. She sits right next to the reapers. And when they finish eating, Boaz tells the reapers, I love this, he's like, Hey, listen, guys, uh, just um, instead of her just having to get this, glean this from the corners, let her follow after behind you and take some from the sheaves that you've got. They're getting these bundles up of these sheaves and they're carrying them. He's like, and listen, by the way, let some of it spill to the ground on purpose. Like if you know she's behind you, just let, it, let some of it fall to the ground. You want to <laughs> wanna see a kid get happy. Uh, years ago, we were at the dealership at Beeman. We did this on a regular basis. We'd take a kid like Carson over here, knowing we had some kids that went into the, uh, the waiting room at the dealership, knowing they're going to be bored there. Listen, if we saw a kid on the service lane, sometimes one of us, we would go in there, and we would put change in the vending machine in the, in the bottom. And then, listen, they'd walk around, and they would get that, and they'd be like, oh, there's money here. There's, it's grace. They would be like, oh, this is amazing. Found something that somebody left behind. You know what I mean? It'd be great to find two quarters. Somebody left behind. We do that, and you'd see a kid's face. Listen, Boaz is saying to his reapers, let some drop to the ground on purpose so that Ruth can gather it easily. Um, so she does. Do you see the picture of grace here? Do you see Jesus Christ in this account? He's here. Number three, we see the day's end. Look back now at verse 17 again. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Um, we'll stop right there, and we'll go on in just a moment. Um, you farmers in here, how much is an ephah of barley? Do you know? Oh, we're going to put them on the spot. Kevin, hey, Kevin, we got them on this one. They don't know. They don't know. Um, an ephah of barley, guess how much it is? <laughs> no, it's 10, I tell you what, it's 10 omers, it's 10 omers. <laughs> How much is an omer? Well, well, what's an omer? You go back into Exodus and you find the people of God that are gathering the manna that falls to the ground. And uh, God instructed them to go out and you could, in those six days you could go out and gather one, basically one day's provision was about as much as Michael Pendergrew could carry. I always have to get Michael Pinnegree in a sermon. Y'all like that? I always have to bring him in. But he has, to, he has to gather, as much as he can gather, is one omer. One omer. Like a day's provision, one omer. And so an ephah of barley's ten omers. What she walks away with to take back to Naomi and back to the house is like basically ten days' provision of, of grain. Now, I'm, I imagine she had to make some trips it's more than anybody's going to get from the corner of the field, amen? It's more abundant than anything anyone else could ever get by natural or normal means. But then again, she ran into Boaz, and he's blessed her. Let me tell you something. Lord Jesus Christ has blessed me and you 
with a F of grace, amen. He has blessed us with more than we could ever imagine in relationships and his blessings and his peace and his security and all that he brings to the table. All that, listen, when you and I get saved and how he blesses us so much, it's amazing. It's over and above anything that you and I could ever imagine as we have come into the family of God. Well, here it is. This day is coming to an end. We've got to read these last few verses. Verse 18, it talks about Ruth. It says, Then she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had cut back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth the Moabitess said, He also said to me, You will stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young women and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Amazing. Quickly, and we'll land the plane on this, Naomi praises the Lord as Ruth tells her about what happened. Let me tell you something. When you tell people about what God did for you, it does bless other people. And here it is. We notice that Naomi connects the dots and recognizes that the Lord is at hand. She recognizes he did this thing. She recognizes that God's providential hand was upon this. And so uh, the day's end, it's a a blessing, a blessing. And so we're back to these links in a chain, a a famine, a family, a funeral, a fear, and we have this field. Two Old Testament books, two Old Testament books talk about salvation in a way that, uh, for me looking at it, maybe even a little bit better than any of the other books. Two books. First one is Exodus. Take a look at the screen. We, when we look at Exodus, we read of redemption by power. And what you have there is you have Moses coming back and saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. And we have all the plagues that take place, powerful demonstrations of God's power just over and over and over again. Then we have the institution of the Passover and the Passover lamb, powerful as, as death would pass over those houses that had the blood that was on the doorpost and the lintel and, and how they were covered by the blood that, that they would not die, the firstborn wouldn't die. Great demonstrations of God's power. They get to the Red Sea as they get delivered out of Egypt. They get to the Red Sea. And Pharaoh's army is barreling in on them and we find God hold them up with a pillar of fire. And then we have what? God parting the Red Sea and the people going across on dry land. But then when Pharaoh and his chariots roll across it, we have the water come down on them and kill them. We're talking about uh, redemption by power is what we see in Exodus. In Ruth, we have, and we read about redemption by purchase. By purchase is what we see here. He is purchasing Ruth, Boaz is. Um, That's what he's doing. He's able to purchase her. He's able to redeem her. We're going to see that even in the next sermon. So last week's was a cliffhanger. This week's going to be another cliffhanger until we get to chapter 3. So you've got to come back, amen? So we have to. Concerning Ruth being purchased by Boaz, if you just look back at where we've been and take a look at the screen, this is Ruth chapter 2. She's in his field. In his field. Next week or next time in chapter 3, We're going to see Ruth at Boaz's feet, submitting to him. And then in Ruth chapter 4, we're going to see Ruth. She's going to be in Boaz's family. Let me tell you something. She don't get in his family unless she was first in his field. She's not going to be in his family unless she is submitting herself at his feet. Today, no one, absolutely no one, gets into the family of God without submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. No one. No one comes into the family of God without saying, Lord, I'm a nobody, and I need to be saved. Lord, I'm a sinner, and I can't save myself. Ruth was in no position to redeem herself. She is a Moabite woman. Listen, uh, under this curse of the Moabite people, in Deuteronomy 23, if you remember from last week, it said, under the 10th 
generation, a Moabite could not be in the assembly of God and worship him. So here's the thing. Under that Deuteronomy 23 and that curse, Ruth, a Moabite, she couldn't be saved. And her kids probably couldn't be saved. And her grandkids may not have been saved. And her great-grandkids couldn't get saved. And her great-great-grandkids, um, ten generations? Ten. Ten. But because of her coming into, listen, if Elimelech and Naomi, the bright spot, they come into this land of Moab, and Ruth meets this family. Sadly, she has a funeral. Her husband dies. Boaz has no chance of redeeming her and making her his own wife and bringing her into his family if Ruth's husband is alive. How about those apples? Let me ask you a question. Is God in charge of births? Yes. When a baby's born, all those things. And listen, those are hard topics. When Nikki and I were, when Nikki was having children, I was the dad, amen. But when Nikki was having children, amen. Listen, we had two miscarriages along the way. One between Paige and Allie. One between Allie and Hannah. I always say in heaven, I got a couple of boys, amen. Yes, a couple of boys. They look just like me. It's great, but they're there. God knew, he knew about both of them. He knew about all those circumstances. And maybe someone here is, th- listen, I know some of you have been through that. And listen, God knows, but you just keep trusting him. God's in charge of births. We know that. Listen, God's also in charge of when you die, I believe. He knows the hair on your head. He knows how many days you've got. He understands all of that. So could God even allow a man to die so that Ruth could be redeemed? I believe this book says that, yeah. You say, I don't know if if I really like that view of God. Well, listen, get in the Word of God, and that's what you'll find. There's a lot of things about God we don't understand. But this, I think we understand this. He's redeeming Ruth. And he's going to use Boaz to do it. And all these other links in the chain. Boaz is more than just some wealthy property owner. He's more than just a relative to Elimelech. We see in chapter 3, he's a kinsman redeemer that does come along. And listen, he meets the requirements of the law. We'll see that next time. He meets every requirement of the law in order to be in a position to redeem Ruth. And we know that Jesus fulfilled the law, amen? Perfectly. He was in a position to be the only person that could redeem us. This is a picture of Christ. All of this happened, but it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't miss that. But I'll tell you this, don't miss what he's saying to you today. Maybe you're here and you've got this, uh, you're wondering about the providence of God. Maybe you're, um, maybe the ball's not bounced your way in the last little while. And you're wondering if God, uh, if he even is noticing or if he cares. Maybe you're uh, wondering if God can turn something around. Could God orchestrate a way for you to see things differently or walk in a different way? Books like Ruth say, absolutely. Maybe a prayer for us today, for every one of us in this room. Maybe we need to, if you don't pray like this, maybe we need to start praying like this. Lord, would you order my steps? Lord, I want to be submissive to whatever you want me to do. Maybe it's where you just let your guard down and say, God, I I want to follow you, whatever that means. Uh, Oftentimes, we want to follow God conditionally. I will do this, God, if it only means this. Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go except over there. I will do whatever you want me to do, but I won't do this thing over here. We've got to quit conditionally putting this stuff on God, saying, I'll do this if you do that. We need to say, God, I'll do what you want me to do. Be where you want me to be. Follow after you. That's exactly what Ruth said to Naomi, but God was listening, and that's what she meant. And you know what? God's taken her up on it. And we see here in the coming weeks, she's the great-grandmother of David. That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen without her submitting to God way back here in this book of Ruth. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father, have your way today. Have your way. May you find in us a, a submissive heart. A submissive heart. Lord, we thank you for this testimony we have in Ruth. Real people walking with you and interacting with you. And you, Lord, on your throne doing what you do. Lord, we love you. Your power is amazing. 
Your love for us is even more amazing. And thank you, Lord, for that love in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe you're here today or someone's watching online and you've never called on the Lord Jesus Christ.